Coming up on Tech News today, it's announcement week. We're going to talk about what Apple might announce, iPad mini, but what else might be coming down the line and their, their troubles with Samsung. Also, Google's got a whole new line of Nexus devices. Leaks from CNET and the Next Web talk about those. And Microsoft Windows 8. Is it going to be a success? Is Steve Sanofsky a jerk? We'll talk about all that and more next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, October 22nd, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by American Express Bank FSB, offering a high-yield savings account, the perfect complement to help you reach your savings goals. To learn more and open an account online, visit personalsavings.com slash online savings, member FDIC. And by ShareFile. Enhance your workflow, send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile by Citrix. Try ShareFile today. For a 30-day free trial, go to ShareFile.com, click the radio microphone, and enter TNT. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your iPhone, iPad, MacBook, or Android smartphones. Find out what your gadget is worth and get cash to upgrade to the latest iPhone at Gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, starting each time with the top 10 of the day in the news feeds. <laughs> Skype for Windows 8 will come to the Windows Store at launch October 26th. It will be pre-installed on 12 models of Windows 8 machines. This version of Skype was entirely rebuilt and uses the Windows Messenger infrastructure and was redesigned to fit in with the Windows 8 tiled interface. Windows 8 launches at midnight October 26th with some stores open late for launch events. Samsung and Apple don't really love each other. Have you heard? <laughs> According to a report from the Korea Times, Samsung plans to stop selling LCD displays to Apple next year with an official stating, we are unable to supply our flat screens to Apple with huge price discounts. Samsung has already cut our portion of shipments to Apple and next year we will stop shipping displays. The report also says that Samsung may be making up for volume elsewhere as Amazon has increased their orders for displays. If you wanted to be surprised at Google's October 29th event, stop mm -hmm. listening right now. <laughs> reports, oh, wow. say, reports say that an updated jelly bean is in the cards, and there's going to be new hardware. There should be a Samsung-produced Nexus 10 tablet, an LG Nexus phone, and an updated Nexus 7 with higher capacity with a new model offering a 3G radio. Spoiler alert. Now start listening. Uh, if you're Norwegian, would you like to get your Amazon Kindle books back? Norwegian IT blogger Martin Becklin posted today about a friend whom he calls Lynn, who received an email from Amazon.co.uk notifying her that her account was suspended. She found her Kindle had been remotely wiped, removing all her books. Lynn emailed Amazon to find out why, but the company only would say that her account was related to a previously blocked account and wished her luck finding another retailer. Best Buy has started to accept pre-orders on Nokia's Lumia 920 and HTC's phone, Windows Phone 8X today. We've got some pricing, too. Nokia's Lumia 920 is set at $149.99. An 8-gig version of HTC's Windows Phone 8X is set at $99.99. Both handsets uh, appear to be available for pre-order from AT&T. No word from Verizon yet. Earlier, Best Buy had the 920 listed. It has since been removed, mm. though the 8X is still there. According to social media advertising specialist TBG Digital... I just stopped listening. Sorry. <laughs> social media advertising. Sorry, sorry. Hey, I had, to, I had to read this. I had to write this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it now, okay? So according to social media advertising specialist Tom, TBG Digital, click-through rates for Facebook ads during Q3, Q3, Q3 were up 81% compared to last quarter. That increase is thanks to Facebook placing ads in its news feed and its mobile offerings. The large increase in click-through rates also caused a large decrease in cost per click. That's good information. But just did anybody introduces themselves as social media advertising specialist? Sorry. I don't know. It's yeah, not your fault. Researchers from the security group at the University of Leibniz in Hanover and the computer science department at the Phillips University of Marburg have found that 8% of 13,500 Android apps they tested did not protect 
bank account, or other personal information. Apps were not malicious, just taking inadequate protective measures. Bioshock Infinite Industrial Revolution. Heard of it? It's a puzzle game and a Bioshock Infinite pre-order bonus where you can earn in-game items. You assume the role of a factory worker within the Sky City of Columbia. Nearly 60 puzzles to play. They're all free. Access only by pre-ordering Bioshock Infinite at a participating real retailer. Head on over to preordernow.com to learn more. That's actually a really good URL. Yeah, no kidding. Sony has become famous for taking away features from the PS3, most notably the ability to run Linux. The Verge reports that at the end of this month, a firmware update will remove the Life with PlayStation app, which contributes to Stanford University's Folding at Home project. That project helps researchers look for cures to diseases like cancer and Alzheimer's. Sony did not explain why they're taking the app away, though. We're one step closer to having a universal translator. NTT Docomo is offering an app that handles real-time phone call translation. The app will be capable of converting Japanese to English, Korean, and Mandarin. All the translating happens on Docomo servers, so it should work on lots of Docomo smartphones. Support for a number of languages like French, Spanish, and Indonesian will be added in late November. The claim is currently 80% accuracy. Wow. That's cool stuff. That is. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by American Express Bank FSB, member FDIC. Let's think about how many of us are saving. Savings is an important thing. Hopefully, we're becoming disciplined about putting away a portion of what we earn. Some of us are keeping a portion of what we earn in the bank. Some of us are saving for a down payment, maybe for a home, for a car. Hopefully, you're able to set aside some funds for an unexpected emergency. But whatever your goals are for saving, here's a good place to put your money. An American Express personal savings high yield savings account gives you a competitive variable interest rate to help you reach your savings goals. You can easily link the savings account to your existing bank account. So you don't have to totally switch banks. And you can transfer money easily depending on your needs and keep track of your balance by phone or web 24-7. No minimums, no fees, and includes great phone support whenever you want to talk to somebody about managing your money. It's a great compliment to your existing financial tools. Just add the American Express personal savings high yield savings account, the FDI insured account offered by American Express Bank FSB for your savings need. Take control of your finances today. Learn more about the account at personalsavings.com slash online savings. And while you're there, you can, you can open an account. No minimums, no fees, no need to switch banks. All you need to do is get started today. Let American Express Personal Savings help you reach your savings goals by opening this high-yield savings account offered by American Express Bank FSB. That's the high yield savings account at personalsavings.com slash online savings. And we thank American Express for their support of Tech News Today. Also want to thank Callie Lewis from coming back and being on the show, host of Geek Beat TV. How's it going, Callie? Going well. Good to have you. I am you. Uh, excited to be back. Well, we have lots of announcements to talk about. No announcements have been made, but we have a lot of announcements that are going to be made. <laughs> and lots of guesses as to what's going to be in those announcements. Next Monday, uh, Google having a uh, 7 a.m. Pacific time, 10 a.m. local time, New York City event to unveil new stuff. They say the playground is open. Uh, but the next web and CNET both reporting that they got an inside scoop about what Google will be talking about. Apparently there was a video at a Google All Hands meeting showing off some of the devices. A uh, 32 gigabyte version of the Nexus 7, uh, one with HSPA+, Plus, one with that. A Nexus 10 made by Samsung, which would be a 10-inch tablet, uh, codenamed Manta, running Android 4.2, We'll get to that in a second. And 2560 by 1600 resolution at 300 pixels per inch. An LG Nexus 4 smartphone. We've been hearing the rumors about that. Quad core, 1.5 gigahertz Snapdragon, 4.7 inch, 1280 by 768 screen, 16 gigs of storage, 2 gigs of RAM, uh, 4.2 Android, no LTE. And what's with that Android 4.2? Is that Key Lime Pie? Apparently not. Uh, Android 4.2 will still be referred to as Jelly Bean, according to the sources from the Next Web and CNET. Uh, and will feature content in the center, a Google Play widget to kind of highlight the content that you've purchased and the content that's available in the Google Play Store, yeah. and tablet sharing for multiple accounts on a tablet, uh, and also a tweak to the panoramic camera. You said yay about the content in the center. The no, tablet. No, I said meh. Oh, you said meh. Yeah. That was my meh. reaction. Yeah, that was very that. meh. But what about the, the user account sharing? Oh. Awesome. And actually, on uh, many episodes, many moons ago, on All About Android, I featured an app that would let you do this. It was kind of a workaround. You had to be rooted. This makes perfect sense for devices that you're likely to share, things like tablets uh, that are more like home devices in a lot of households, and they're shared amongst many people. This way, you can uh, log into different uh, profiles, have different settings for each profile, if this is to be um 
to be true. Yeah, it, it sounds like a, a nice slate of devices. Uh, I'd like to see a Nexus 10. The Nexus 7 is very good. If they could pull that off at a 10-inch tablet, then then we got a real horse race if Apple comes out with a Mini. And the other thing is, what is what is Google going to price these things at? Because, I mean, the, ne the Nexus devices, at least the uh, Nexus 7, was priced pretty much at cost. If they can come out with a 10-inch tablet, kind of like what, what Amazon did at cost, with this crazy resolution, 2560 by 1600, 300 PPI, that's higher than the, iP the iPad right now. If they can if they can price that very low, Apple's going to have a really hard time competing with that because Google does have an ecosystem. I mean, it's growing and growing and growing with Google Play. And with this, this slate of devices, it seems pretty interesting. Slate of slates. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, knew that was a mistake. Kelly, what do you think of the LG Nexus 4, though? If, if the rumor is true, no LTE, is that a comp is it, are they trying to make it a mid-range phone? I guess it depends on the price. Uh, yeah, it depends on the price. I, I suppose they are. Um, but I think this day and age, it's kind of silly to release anything without LTE. Um, or, you know, does it have 3G? That, pr yeah. Presumably, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you have to have... Uh, the, where I get frustrated is by having, you know, zero capability, data connect, connectivity, um, and just having Wi-Fi. I mean, I, for the most part, everyone I know, unless maybe you guys in San Francisco have enough Wi-Fi hotspots uh, that are around and freely available to, to use a Wi-Fi-only device. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I would like to see LTE in it, but uh, with the, the Samsung devices, you know, I, I love Samsung hardware, so I'm looking forward to seeing those. And I think that Google definitely benefits from these partnerships because I think Samsung is out to win it for sure. And uh, so I think Google will benefit from from everything they do with Samsung. I can't wait to get my hands on them. And with Samsung, as we heard in the news views, uh, kind of slowing down their business with Apple, it yeah. makes sense for them to partner more with Google. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a smart move. And, uh, you know, while all these lawsuits are going on, they certainly can't be buddy-buddy <laughs> with Apple at the same time, or it's, it's at least difficult to do so. But I, you know, like Jason said, I, I'm really excited about the, um, the multiple users and the, that, because I think, you know, going in that direction, if we are looking at our tablets as becoming our sole computers in the future, you have to have that, just like desktops have that, you know, just, just to kind of repeat that. But what any of these turn your head, Sarah? You know, all right. Well, I'm obviously, uh -oh. uh, well, no, I'm, I'm an Apple customer. So I look at all of the stuff and I think just from a high level, I say more so than ever, it's uh, Android versus iOS. And I'm of course not even bringing Windows into this whole thing at all. And in another month, I'd probably be much more of a game of three players rather than two, but we're now at a position where the iPad doesn't really give you anything that's more special than something that Google, Samsung, uh, and partners can roll out. It just turns into a, well, what's your preference? Um, someone like Jason will say, I, mean, I, I don't know, these tablets are just as nice. So you have stuff like, hey, if you want to go with a uh, tablet that can give users multiple accounts, true multiple accounts, you can't do that on iOS. Yeah, that's true. And that's really attractive, especially with a family who's sharing a single tablet. Well, let's talk about the iPad mini announcement that we expect to happen uh, tomorrow. I think I think it's fairly safe to say we're going to get an iPad mini. I mean, that, that that seems like a high confidence rumor. What what else is going on? There? Well, so we talked a little bit earlier, and you mentioned just now that, uh, that Apple and Samsung are possibly going to sever uh, their LCD relationship entirely. Senior Samsung source, not someone who is named, uh, speaking to the Korea Times, says it's because of insufficient margins because of how Apple changed its supply pricing strategy, meaning specifically the pricing on Apple's latest iPad display, so the, the, the Retina iPad, new iPad, iPad 3 display, had caused Samsung to earn only half as much per pixel on production compared to previous models. Now, any company might say, listen, we just aren't making as much money, so we've got to figure out another way um, to, to increase our margins, but this is Samsung and Apple we're talking about. So this is a souring relationship anyway. Um, also, Wired reporting that Samsung has cut, uh, I'm sorry, that Apple has cut uh, Samsung out of iPad mini production entirely. Um, Samsung is widely known to uh, be superior to other companies such as LG making retina displays. 
But if the iPad mini isn't going to be a retina display, then Apple has a lot of other options. AUO, Chimay, Inalux Corp, Sharp, Handstar, Tianma are all companies that analysts have thrown out uh, that say they can add to Apple's production uh, line, not necessarily retina, but that still remains to be seen. I think most people don't expect a retina display for an iPad mini tomorrow. No, I, I wouldn't. It might be close to the, you know, the resolution of the iPad 2. Sure. But I, I, I think it's going to be a bargain. And I don't That's actually think that it's a huge deal. For me, having already having used the iPad with a retina display long enough, it would be hard to go back. You know, you look at you look at uh, previous models and it's like, oh, it's, yeah, it's just so messy, you know? It's going back to SD from HD. But if you don't already have an iPad, then it's still pretty cool. And they're not marketing to people who already have iPads. They're marketing to people, schools... Um, and and customers who are really interested in the tablet, maybe like the smaller form factor, but want to pay less. If it's really going to be an iPad mini, it's got to run all the tablet apps the iPad does. And the old iPad, I think, was 1024 by 768 or something pretty minuscule that you can fit in the 7-inch form factor nowadays. When they were talking like a long time ago, you got to get sandpaper for your fingertips. Back then, to have a 7-inch display, you probably would have a really, really low resolution. It'd be like a big iPod touch. It would just be a mess. But now, because of the way the technology has moved, you can actually have a 7-inch that's comfortable. I've had that with the Nexus 7. You just have to have good eyes. Well, yeah, pretty much. But I'm sure the text will be uh, somewhat readable. But, I mean, this is a... Somewhat. It'll. <laughs> they won't release something that's just somewhat really readable, even if it's not a retina display. I mean, it's going to be good enough, you know? I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be good for reading and all of that. I was thinking also about the displays. Uh, if this is a huge opportunity for so many companies that made televisions at this point, like Sony was like obviously losing tons of money, uh, Panasonic, everyone is pretty much joined together for their own display units. If Samsung is no longer making displays for, for Apple, like there's a huge bunch of like Japanese companies that would love to take that position as well because why not? Apple's a huge customer. So this, is, this could, be a, it could have really long-term effects for the whole industry. Kelly, what do you expect us to hear tomorrow? Uh, definitely the iPad mini. Uh, we released a whole parody video on it um, uh, about a week ago. Um, but I, so, so of course, I, I believe um, that it'll come out and I, I certainly hope to see it. You know, I've been watching teenagers and, and if their focus is on education, um, I think it'll be very interesting to, to see because all the teenagers I know would prefer to do something, you know, on their phone rather than on their iPad. Um, and so will they be able to capture that, you know, seven inch market or that, you know, around that, that, uh, that size, that in between market with the students? I would hope so. And I think that they probably could. So I'd like to see it, but you know, when, and when we talk about price, I think uh, we have to keep in mind that I think we'll see it a bit higher than we would expect if we're thinking, you know, educational market here because they already have in place an entire program for schools with discounts and all of that. So they're going to price it for the regular consumer, but then offer those, you know, discounts, discounts. That's a really good for, point. for education. Smaller hands, not smaller prices necessarily. For the right. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. Right. So I guess I, I'm not going to be able to use it. Yeah, oh, me well. either. Uh, <laughs> you Okay, so we have new Android tablets hitting the market. We'll, we're probably going to see a new iPad and maybe even an update to the current new iPad. Does the new iPad become the old iPad if a new iPad comes? Anyway. The old new iPad. It just becomes iPad. We'll, we'll deal with that tomorrow. Uh, and then on They're Friday. They're not going to change the game, are they? Yeah, I don't know. Friday, October 26th, we're going to get a ton of new tablets from Microsoft. It's their big gamble, Windows 8. Is it confusing that there's Windows RT and Windows 8 and that the, some of the tablets that run Windows 8 will be able to run all the old Microsoft so yes. uh, software and some of them won't? Uh, this is all Steve Sanofsky's doing, and CNET had a big article about his style of management. What is it about people named Steve being controversial as managers? Well, they seem like they want to have lots and lots of power. Oh, uh, Steve's. Steve's. They're really, they're really a lot of work. Oh, <laughs> CNET has this really good in-depth look at Steven Sanofsky. He is the president of the Windows division and the Windows Live division. He previously had, uh, he was the head of, of the Office division for a while. And uh, pretty much, he's, Sanofsky's put together a world which, which pretty much puts control in his hands. Uh, critics are saying that it makes it harder to innovate at Microsoft, and it leads to, this is a quote from an unnamed exec, a soulless product. So I guess Windows 8 has no soul. Uh, CNET interviewed 
15 current and former Microsoft executives and executives who have worked with Sanofsky directly. So these are like partners as well. Uh, they said he's really smart. He's really you know, detail oriented. He can explain technical terms very easily, but he can create a toxic work environment that has chased talented employees away. Uh, but, but Sanofsky's got Balmer's and, and Gates support for, for years. Although now, apparently Sanofsky's running into or butting heads with Steve Ballmer. Steve Ballmer has this crazy idea. He wants the Windows group to work with the other divisions. And apparently Steven Sanofsky doesn't really care for that. He wants everybody to kind of just bow down to well, him. And Sanofsky gets credit for Windows 7, right? Mm -hmm. And deservedly so. Windows 7 saved Windows after Vista, which some people still try to argue Vista wasn't as bad as everyone thought, but nobody argues that Vista was better than XP. And Windows 7 brought Windows back to say, okay, look, we, we fixed all the problems with Vista. Yeah, and, and the piece also talks about how Sanofsky, since he's so pro Windows, doesn't like those other skunk work pro uh, projects like the Courier and how he pretty much had that killed because Windows was going to be the, the center of Microsoft's universe. Sanofsky's approach is flat out Windows centric. It makes a lot of sense. He's the head of, of the Windows division. Windows has been the flagship product for Microsoft for a long time. But at this point, would Microsoft be better served in switching its, 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 its core focus? Because Bombers was saying Windows, Windows, Windows is where our future is. Should it be Xbox? Should it be Enterprise? Where should it go? Uh, if you switch the internal focus to Xbox over Windows, I mean, what happens with the rest of this year? I, I, that doesn't really make any sense. I think, it, I think it actually makes perfect sense that Sanofsky and people at the top say Windows is the core product. Everything has to emanate from Windows because that is who we are and that is how everybody stays on the same page. And you can collaborate throughout the company. Xbox is, is a strong product, but I don't see how it makes sense to say we're just going to get away from Windows and go with a brand name that people like better just because it's a great name and a great product. It's, I think it has a lot more to do with how will tablets and Xbox figure out a way to be threaded more evenly in the future. Kelly, do you think that uh, Sanofsky is making Windows and Microsoft soulless? <laughs> I don't I don't know about that. I mean, in any leadership position, you do have to have a combination of you know creativity uh, along with control. Um, but you you do have to allow your your people to feel like they have the ability to, you know, ne not necessarily have an overall say, but have some creative um creative in input. So it, it doesn't sound like he's doing that, which is sad. Um, I don't think, I think I, you know, I'm going to love Windows 8. I, I'm looking forward to it. So can we call it a soulless product? Maybe from the point of view of employees, but I don't think that the consumers in general will think of it as, as, as soulless. I, I think people are going to be pretty excited about it. I look at that HP Envy that's coming out mm -hmm. on Friday, uh, running actual Windows 8, and I get excited about that because yeah. now the tile interface makes sense because I can use it with a touchscreen, and then I could use it with a stylus if I want to go into multiple mode and actually be able to do some real work by attaching that keyboard to it. And I, I think that is the dream that Sanofsky is pushing here, and I think it's a good one. The problem is there's so many other use cases, and the, and the market is, is competitive in so many other areas. I'm not sure Windows 8 makes sense in those areas. And that is where Sanofsky's vision of we have to push windows above everything starts to falter because the operating system isn't as important as it used to be and it's getting less important all the time where microsoft wins is by being the cloud provider and saying look windows is where you live right now you 90 percent of you still live there so don't worry about being in windows we're, we're going to be a windows into a wider world and microsoft is going to serve that world as well emphasize SkyDrive, emphasize Office 360. They have a, a ton of, I hear Paul Thorat complaining about this all the time on Windows Weekly. They have a ton of great products that people just don't seem to remember. They know about them, that's but they don't point. remember to use them. Uh, and that's because Microsoft is so Windows centric, I feel like. I'm sure Windows 8 is going to be a success, but I'm, I'm more concerned with the fact that people like Ray Ozzie and Jay Allard were pretty much chased away from Microsoft. And these were guys who were going to do something big. Jay Allard was a part of the Skunk Works project that made the Xbox. So it wasn't like this guy was working on some crazy projects. He, and this is a very successful division for Microsoft. On top of that, it, they had this plan for the courier. But since Windows 8 was lagging behind, there was no way they could do this. So they had to kill this amazing tablet that could have been. Who knows where Microsoft would have been if they released a totally different interface. Instead of going tiles or not, mm. this would be a, a, could have been a game changer. Could. 
Good. Yeah, but see, it's the thing. Like, we'll never know because we have Steven Zanofsky kind of driving people away. So I'm kind of curious what could possibly, what's the alternative, you know, reality Microsoft that they're doing all these innovative products versus saying everything has tiles. So I'm just hoping that maybe. Is, so you, you, hate, you hate the tiles? Is that no, what I you're don't, saying? Yeah, I, yeah we'll put, let's put words in my mouth. I hate no, the no, tiles. No, 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 I don't, no, I don't, I don't I tiles. mean to do that. Oh, no, no. I, I really like the tiles. They're just pretty much standardized widgets as far as I'm concerned. I love widgets. Yeah. So I'm just kind of curious about what other hardware Microsoft would have done, though. It seems like okay. if they're all software-centric and now they have the service, I mean, like, it's there could have been more. Just kind of curious what they could have done with their millions of dollars. Believe in the surface, I as. I will. It's the future of Microsoft. Trust the surface. Trust, Trust it. it. <laughs> All right, let's take a quick break and uh, thank our other sponsor for today's show. Share file from Citrix. So when you email a file, you are just sending it. However, with share file, you get so much more than that. First of all, large files that you can't fit through email, they get bounced back some. Not a problem with share file. You store them in the cloud. The link gets sent to the other person. They securely can download that file to their desktop seamlessly. In fact, it, it integrates so well in Outlook, it just works like an attachment. Uh, as long as they've got an internet connection, they're not even going to notice that it's not a regular email. Plus, the files are always under your control. If you realize, wait a minute, that's the wrong file, you can switch it. Uh, you can make sure that only the right people are viewing the file. Files can be pretty much any size. And it's a secure way to transfer files and keep them confidential. You can put a password on the files. You can make sure that people actually who were supposed to read it in a timely fashion got it and read it, and you can follow up, and it's so easy to use. ShareFile allows you to access files remotely from your laptop, your tablet, your smartphone. That's why so many businesses rely on ShareFile every day as an important part of their daily workflow. I use it for sensitive documents in Run and Sword and Laser LLC and, and doing other freelance sorts of things. I highly recommend ShareFile and strongly believe that professionals in pretty much any industry are going to benefit. So don't take my word for it, though. Try ShareFile today. Sign up with a special offer, a full 30-day free trial. Go to ShareFile.com, click on the radio microphone, and enter TNT. Remember, visit ShareFile.com, type in TNT, and we thank them for their support. And thanks Citrix for their ongoing support of Tech News Today. Good article up on Reuters today profiling Marissa Meyer and some of the things she's doing behind the scenes. We haven't really heard a lot about what she's doing, but she's been busy. She has been busy. I, I mean, I think over the last year and some change, we've all sort of chuckled about the Yahoo being the media services company, whatever it was that they said that they were. We kind of chuckled about it because nobody really got what that meant. Uh, Meyer, and this is no real surprise, but we see more evidence than ever, is a product person. She wants to focus on, you know, simplicity, simple user design, and is really abandoning a lot of the media efforts that uh, were started under Ross Levinson and going with the tech approach because that's what she does and that's what... Uh, Yahoo actually has 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 a potential shot um, at getting back into the game with you know deals with ABC News for example we had that original series starting Tom Hanks that was going to be exclusive to Yahoo that's all kind of media stuff but a little confusing really when Yahoo has a certain legacy as a tech company but then a future of a media company that doesn't really seem to be an actual major player and can't compete with cable it was weird. So it's like, okay, well, if Yahoo's a media, or I'm sorry, a technology company now, who's it going up against? Google? Facebook? Yikes. That sounds hard. But think about how much trouble a company like Facebook has had just this year in trying to convert users into mobile users where they can make uh, ad dollars off of. They're, they're trying it, but Zuckerberg, people at, at the top level um, of Facebook have said really publicly, yeah, you know, we should have done this a while ago. This is actually pretty difficult. We've got a lot of users, but the future is in mobile. So Yahoo is almost at this uh, precipice of s uh, sort of a mobile future that I think is really interesting. They also have, um, they've got some money, uh, two billion uh, in cash. Um, and they have been talking to companies, according to sources, of course, um, companies that can help boost their mobile engagement, their ad sales when it comes to not just mobile, but ad sales overall. Uh, Meyer hired Henrique de Castro as the uh, COO that was last week. Um, and people say he's not only an ad whiz, good with people though, can focus on running a sales team, which is something that Meyer according to people within the company, hasn't really been paying much attention to. That's not her thing. That's yeah. not her strength. She's not a salesperson. Yeah, so she's hiring people, put them in this situation where they can keep that part, a very important part of Yahoo, alive and thriving while she works on product. Sources tell it's Reuters. A... Go ahead, Callie. 
Oh no, I was just going to say it's a smart decision, you know, when you're when you don't have strengths, hire the people to uh to fill those strengths in. Exactly. Uh possible interest and this is again sources that uh decline to to state their name say Yahoo might uh, possibly be interested in a company like OpenTable for example. If you're not familiar with them, uh, that is a way that you can make uh, dinner reservations, seating reservations online. Uh, they have uh, partnerships, really good partnerships with a variety of companies. Yelp is one that comes to mind, but many others. That's a hot property. Uh, that could be really interesting for Yahoo. Um, Google has snagged a lot of these types of companies up uh, in the past. Zagat comes to mind, um, a company that already has a really strong uh, user brand for consumers that integrates fairly well. It still remains to be seen what Yahoo is going to do with Zagat or with what Google is going to do with Zagat, but. Something like that can really strengthen Yahoo, particularly on the mobile side. That would be such a good relationship for them to have. And again, technically, they have the money. They just have to be smart about their acquisitions. They need to put the peanut chunks back in the peanut butter. Make it thick and not <laughs> too smooth. Spread so thinly. <laughs> Uh, there's a, a whole old memo from several years back about Yahoo spreading the peanut butter too thin. And, and not to push the metaphor too far, but it sounds like that's what Marissa Meyer is saying is, look, let's get back to the basics. Right. Let's not spread the peanut butter too thin. Let's work on making the stuff we do well really great. Let's Yahoo Mail doesn't look hardly any different than it has for years. And, and it was pointed out in, in one of these articles I read. So I think it's smart to get, say, all right, let's make our stuff great. Let's make it st great for the customer, focus on the customer, and where the customer is, is mobile. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you get the engineers excited and building a product for mobile, that's how you crack mobile. You get people to use your stuff. Right. The other thing is, Yahoo's got to figure out how to take, I mean, they have a ton of properties they've acquired over the years. They're kind of just sitting around. They're not really working together. I mean, you can, you can use your Yahoo ID to log into Flickr and things, but the integration is really not there. Like what Google did is they flattened everything, right? Everything's all together. For better or worse, at least you can get from one property to the next. It used to be very, very spread out. And if, if Yahoo did do something like get OpenTable or something, some other acquisitions, they got to figure a way to keep everything together in one cohesive experience because if they do have all these little parts everywhere, people don't even remember it to be a Yahoo property unless it's all in one space. So I... I think that it's really about how can you have an experience that you remember that I'm still using Yahoo. Oh, Yahoo's really good at this and that and the other thing. But right now it's like, what did, what do they do? Do they have a front page with news? <laughs> I, something like that. I, I think, you know, it's a, it, it's definitely smart. They, they shouldn't have, they shouldn't be focusing on a strategy like the media stuff that hasn't been working for them. So I think Marissa coming in and, and, you know, doing those is, is definitely a smart move. Um, I just, just a point on the Google Yahoo, the, you know, integrating all of that. I agree with you that they need to be more integrated. Totally agree with you. But when it comes to Google and how much they've integrated themselves with all the different services, there's some major problems with that at the same time. You know, like, for example, having to, you know, have the same email address across the board, which sounds great, but in reality presents some, some challenges for a lot of people. So I'd like to see them, if they're going to do that, uh, go a little bit of a different direction if, if possible. Yeah, I, I, you, Google has to be really good at everything it does for all of that stuff to work. And, and where people complain is where they're not as good at one part of it. And it starts to bring down that whole integration. So that's something sure. that you have to be good at. What Google thinks is we're an engineering-driven company, so we'll eventually fix all that stuff. And and they <laughs> eventually do. I mean, I have to say, I used to totally avoid logging in with multiple IDs when they first rolled it out because it just caused me no end of trouble. That yeah. seems to work a lot better now. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it does. It go, going back to Yahoo's, uh, you know, change of focus, having being engineering driven, it, at least gets you that benefit. Make Flickr better again. Yay! Yay. Yay. <laughs> I mean, I joke, but I, I mean, that this is the perfect project for them. I joke, but seriously, make it better. Yeah. Now. <laughs> it's not funny anymore. Serious jokes. Uh, let's talk about this, uh, this Kindle story. A uh, customer named Lynn in Norway who says that uh, her entire Kindle access was revoked. Uh, there's an IT blogger in Norway who's bringing the story. So some people are, are skeptical what's really going on here, but they have quotes uh, from an email from amazon.co.uk. Lynn is a Norwegian. 
Uh, so she was using Amazon.com, she says, to buy books. And, and so a little puzzled why Amazon.co.uk is the one that is, is coming to her and saying, we're wiping out your account, your account is in violation, uh, and we're sorry, we're not going to tell you why, and we're not going to do anything to resolve the situation. Good luck. Uh, Cory Doctorow on Boing Boing explains that he suspects the policy violation Lynn stands accused of is using a friend's UK address to buy English Kindle books from Norway. Now, remember that when you publish an edition of a book, usually it's got regional rights. So you may have Penguin have the rights in the United Kingdom, and you might have Macmillan have the rights to the book in the United States. Only Macmillan can sell the copy in the United States. Only Penguin can sell the copy in the UK. However, there's something called open territory. Certain non-English speaking countries, like Norway, are considered open territories for English language books. And in those cases, in the example I gave, Macmillan and Penguin could both sell the same title in English in Norway. E-tailers do not respect open territory. In fact, they, according to Doctor, they notoriously uh, refuse to acknowledge open territory and basically say, if you don't have the rights to publish a book in a territory, we won't publish it there. So he's suggesting that what's happened here is the user Lynn uh, was maybe using VPN or maybe using another address to buy the English language UK books to get around this ban on English language books in Norway, uh, which should be an open territory. And they caught her at it, said it's a policy violation and we're cutting you off. But they don't, because what scammers want to do is try to talk their way out of this thing, they've got a policy of saying, well, we're not going to explain to you what the problem is. I was thinking about how ridiculous this whole thing is with, just, <laughs> with, with, these are books, okay? There's no reason these things can't be distributed internationally from the beginning sure that's um, it's this it, it to, to have your to have your things like your access revoked and to to have these i mean every device is getting more and more connected right and we want connected devices but this is the downside of it right if somebody's constantly pinging your system you could lose access to your own things i mean i've i've actually turned off the 3g to my old kindle i have an old like 3g kindle so i turn off the wi-fi be, or the wireless because I don't want anything like this happening. I know I've gotten like some free books and things. And I don't want to find out. They're like, oh, by the way, it's gone. This reminds me of that story. Remember, it's 1984. It was one of the books that was removed, which was hilarious. Yeah. Of a great title to pick to remove from a Kindle. It's just, it, it's just the downside of having always connected devices. It's really sad that you have to turn off your wireless connection um, at all. Uh, their their response, and I, I guess I understand if they're trying to you know avoid scammers talking their way back in, but their their response just irked me, like nothing, nothing. And as a consumer, you would be just very frustrated by the lack of, if if she didn't act, have a clue what she was doing wrong, you know that's just you got to provide something from a customer service standpoint. Ugh. Yeah. We are unable to provide detailed information on how we link related accounts. Please know that we have reviewed your account on the basis of information provided and regret to inform you it will not be reopened. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate this is not the outcome you hoped for and apologize for any disappointment. Well, okay, it's all good. <laughs> oh, now. you appreciate that. Don't okay. you? I mean, they're very polite, but at the same time, they're saying, F you, we're not going to do anything about it and we're not going to explain what happened. Uh, and. You know, again, lots of people are skeptical about what's really going on here. Is this, you know, the, would would Amazon really do this? Maybe she was actually doing something more nefarious that isn't coming out in this blog post from Martin Beckeland uh, that Check. deserved this sort of, of treatment. Uh, but it is, no matter what the truth of this matter is, it is frightening to think that Amazon has your entire library uh, under its control. And if they decide to delete it, they can. And they can see what pages you've read and all of that. I mean, you should be aware of that. If I'm not saying you shouldn't go buy Kindle books, but you should be aware about of that and think about it when you make your purchase decision. All right. That it? Anybody, any other uh, thoughts on the Kindle before we go to Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> saying, you know what? Forget about being worried. Just share. Yeah, Everybody share just everything. Share. <laughs> so <laughs> I, oh, I don't have anything extra on the Kindle thing, but let's talk about Mark Zuckerberg. He was giving a talk at Y Combinator Startup School. He was talking about you know, a whole bunch of things like a lot of companies are working on small problems and he's seeing a lot of startups that are copying other companies and that's just not going to succeed. But the most interesting quote's got to be, quote, we expect this rate of sharing will double every 10 years. So in 10 years from now, people will be sharing about 1,000 times as many things as they do today. Okay, so when I saw that, I, I have to figure out, I have to ask everybody. 
Sarah, do you plan on sharing 1,000 times so more? So this is like a new Zuck's Law thing that's, <laughs> that's just right. supposed to... Okay. Uh, I mean, 1,000 times more things mm -hmm. within the next decade. It's. I think it's very hard for me to sit here and, and say yes or no, because I don't even really understand what that would be. I mean, I, I feel like I thought of 1,000 things and wrote them down on a piece of paper. Like, I'd probably run out way before 1,000. What would I share that I'm not sharing? But maybe I'm just not thinking of the right stuff. I mean, maybe there's... I don't know, strings of DNA that I could be sharing <laughs> with a company. And then there'd Please be, don't. well, I'm just, I'm trying to like, how, a thousand things? Like, well, of, of I, what? I don't know if the thousand number is, is right, but at the same time, you know, and unfortunately I have to agree with him that we will be sharing as a whole, a whole lot more. I mean, would you have expected that you were going to be sharing pictures of your food? you know, five years ago or six years ago before Twitter started. I, I mean, yeah, it's, I it, already did <laughs> on Mo blogs. Or saying that you're on the toilet or whatever. In 1984, <laughs> you know what I mean? if someone said someday you'll be sending pictures of your lunch around the world for everyone to see, you probably would have thought, really? I don't, yeah. I don't I think yeah. that's the best use yeah. of technology. But people are accepting more and more privacy out the window just naturally without thinking about it because of these services. Now, I'm I'm not saying that, you know, I I don't use I use them on a daily basis, but uh, I'm also pretty conscious and I think more so than other people about what that privacy level is that I'm okay sharing. So, will we be sharing I mean a thousand times more, I would think, would be like our deepest, darkest thoughts, which I don't know if any human is ever going to go that far. But. I don't even know <laughs> most of the things I think. I mean, I would much less be able to share them. I, I with you, Kelly, like, let's not get too literal about the thousand times right. uh, thing, but will we be sharing more in the future? Yes. And, and, yeah. and, and probably con considerably more. I've always felt that our reluctance and our conservativeness about sharing is because we grew up in a time that you didn't share things as easily and it's it wasn't normal to share things you know around the world and and uh, people are growing up in a world where it is normal to share this you know we're pushing the boundaries out so certain things that we think would n never be shared are going to be perfectly normal in the future and and sharing is going to continue to rise uh and 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 that isn't necessarily a bad thing i mean if you talked to victorians about the sort of things we talk about in public to each mm -hmm. other they would they would have a conniption. They would die of consumption on the spot or, or some Victorian disease. They they wouldn't believe <laughs> bad humors. that you would, yeah, some bad humors would rise and the black bile would come out of their eyes. They would not believe that we do, we do the things we do today. So I think it's fair to say that we won't believe what people are going to talk about in the future. Well, it seems like it's gotten a lot easier to share at any given time. I know when I bought, like, I think paper towels on Amazon, it's like, do you want to share this information? I'm like, no. Why would I, t I don't, I'm doing it right now. I'm telling everybody that I bought paper towels. But... <laughs> Why on earth would I have to put this on Twitter and Facebook and everything else? But there's an option now, and the, that was not a thing like five years ago. My wife took a picture of a pizza box this weekend at Tomatina in San Rafael. It had Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest on the pizza box. Like, hey, please, what, no share code? that you are eating this pizza. Was it that the pizza company had a Pinterest page? Yeah. It just said their URL, and then it had all the logos saying, like, yeah, hey. Yeah, it's just saying that they're, that they're part of the social space, yeah. which is good, right? I don't know. I I I think that's a little confusing. Well, quite very honestly, social, you know. It shares. <laughs> it's just, yeah. I think they're just, they're putting logos that they think are cool on their boxes. I think it's partly that. Yes, uh, but but I think yeah, I think pizza is social. I mean, I agree, some of the things I I think about this when it comes to Facebook is, I uh, I mean, I'm downloading apps all day long. I mean, between i5 and iPad today, I mean, it, there's all sorts of apps. These new apps that spring up all the time. And I'm constantly faced with, you want to sign in through Facebook. Sometimes it'll give me a Twitter or a Facebook option, or then I can use my email address. And more often than not, it's Facebook or email, and I just go, yeah, sure, Facebook, it's easy. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's um, this frictionless sharing thing. And I'll turn off stuff that, it, uh, for the most part, that lets it, um, the app post to my Facebook wall. I mean, even just something as little as that, that's all contributing to, to me sharing more. It's not really sharing a lot of personal stuff about me. It's Facebook knowing more about me based on what I'm doing outside of Facebook. So I think that plays into this a lot too. Interesting stuff. Yeah, Absolutely. definitely. All right, let's move on to the randomizer.
when we have a choice. Randomizer. Do we want to talk about NASA's 13.5 billion years of galaxy evolution compressed into a two-minute video? Oh. Or a breakthrough using supercomputers to decipher the world's oldest undeciphered writing? I Go. I kind of like the two minute video. All right, let's watch the Don't two minute video. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, I was going to. You were going to go for okay. deciphered writing. Oh, well. We'll leave both links in the I'll show I'll just mope notes. in the corner over yeah. here. <laughs> we'll just work on deciphering it, and then you, you can post all of it. Okay. But this, they're both pretty cool, actually. This one uh, it, it basically showing 13.5 billion years of a galaxy's evolution as, as uh, simulated. Uh, uh, on 1 million CPU hours, the Pleiades supercomputer uh, did the work of this. And it's not only just pretty and cool, it's scientifically accurate as, sure? as far it as looks, we know. It looks a lot like the visualizer from iTunes. I'm really <laughs> <laughs> you think they ripped it off? <laughs> They're like, yeah, you, you watch this. This is the this is just, this is just somebody's iTunes. On Actually, it's just three people smoking out of view of the camera. <laughs> Near a vent. Yes. <laughs> that's actually how the universe was created. Right. Smokers. Well, and they're shooting it with an iPhone 5, but that's why it's purple. Right, exactly. <laughs> Direct light right oh. there. Hey. Look, it's getting, good. it's getting bigger. And, oh, and and it's eating other galaxies. Yeah. Stop. When do the people come? Oh, it's purple like Galactus. Awesome. Yeah. Anyway, cool we, you can watch the whole two-minute video uh, again. at NASA oh. or uh, find the link in our show notes, twit.tv slash TNT. Let's take a break. Thank our other sponsor for today's show, gazelle.com. You need some cash for your used gadgets? Sell your iPhone today and get a new iPhone or maybe get an iPad mini or a Nexus 10 or a Windows Surface machine. There's so many gadgets out there to buy. Simplest way to make some money is to take your old gadgets, your old iPhone, your old iPad, and go to Gazelle. Lock in a quote right now. Even if you're like, I'm not sure I want to sell it, Tom, go lock in the quote. It's risk-free, and you lock it in for 30 days. Gadget's probably not going to get more valuable over time, so why not lock in that quote now? Find out how much they'll give you, and then you can take 30 days to decide what gadget you're going to buy. If you're swapping phones, you can actually go buy the new phone and then send off the old phone to get the cash from Gazelle. Once you send it off to them, they'll check and make sure that it's the right condition. Uh, and, and be honest about the condition because they'll pay you even if it's broken and in some cases. And when they get the gadget, if they say, you know, this is a, you were a little hard on yourself, they'll, they'll upgrade to, to a higher level, give you more money. Uh, they just want to be accurate and they'll pay you by PayPal or by check. Uh, as soon as they, they pay for the shipping, so you print out the shipping label, send it to them. As soon as they get it, they get, send you an email, say, hey, we got the box. We're looking at it now. And within a few days, you've got the cash in your PayPal account or you got the check on the way to you. Go to gazelle.com, though, G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. Find out what your gadget is worth today. Don't wait. Recycle the easy way. Visit gazelle.com. And we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Is there an item or two on the calendar you'd like to tell us about? You know, I didn't think that there was, but now that I think harder, yeah. there is. Okay, cool. uh, tomorrow's Apple event starts at 10 a.m. Pacific time. That's in San Jose, California. We will be covering it live, so the schedule is as follows. We start TNT at 9 a.m., so an hour earlier than usual. We will go right into the Apple event, which starts at 10, and then right after the Apple event wraps up, we will go right into MacBook Week. Or Mac <laughs> MacBook Weekly. We'll, go into we'll take our MacBooks Weekly. to Mac talk about break. MacBook Break. <sighs> It should be called Mac. Although we should break out all of our shows into <laughs> individual devices. Somebody had a really good argument for why we should start doing a Mac app show. And I was like, uh, no. No. Okay. That's really uh, good idea, no. So that's tomorrow. Uh, you know, it's a fairly and, big event. But that's not the only thing We will record tomorrow. the segment of TNT that talks about the announcement after the announcement. So if Tech News Today is coming a little late for you tomorrow, that would be why. Exactly. Also, Asus's Vivo Book and Vivo Tab event is tomorrow. So, Apple, don't think that you're the only cool kid on the block. Um, they're really going to bring the noise. That's not all. Tomorrow is also Facebook and Netflix earnings. This would actually be a great day for them to report not so great earnings because people will no, be paying less notice. attention. Uh, but the earnings are out. And the fifth robot Hall of Fame induction ceremony um, for, uh, starts at 6.30 p.m. Eastern time in Pittsburgh is tomorrow as well. Go there. Okay, there you go, Pirates fans. Got yeah. something to look forward it's to. It's a big day tomorrow. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. Uh, we got a video mail from Robert on Google's SEC misfile. Thank you, Robert. Explain, please. Hello, TNT crew. This is Bob from Sterling Heights, Michigan. Just thought I'd give you a brief explanation about that Google filing last week. used to work as a financial printer, and one of the things that occurs during a filing is what's called a test filing. This is done to test the formatting, the search criteria, and other requirements that the SEC has for a filing. Uh, sometimes this is done multiple times. It's 
done just to be sure that the document isn't rejected by the SEC. Uh, most recent, most often the reason for this is that the final filing is done in co uh, coordination with the press release. And so timing is critical and they don't want to have the press release put out and then the filing rejected by the SEC. So most likely this was what happened. It should have been a test filing and it was in fact filed as a live file. And hence the confusion. Love the show. Keep up the good work. We have the smartest audience in the world. Thank you, Bob. And I'm sorry for calling you Robert. I was so it was very formal. Well, it's probably his yeah. given name. His, full, his Christian name. Yes. His given name. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, great explanation. And now I actually understand a little bit. Like and it's still a mistake, but mm -hmm. I understand what mistake was made. We also got a bunch of people uh, explaining to us why the Microsoft quarterly results defer the Windows 8 income. Uh, so many, it's hard to choose which one actually explained it best. You all did a great job. We'll go with Mukund, who said, I heard your discussion on Microsoft quarterly results. There is indeed an accounting rule behind the deferral of revenue. The U.S. accounting rule requires delivery of a product without any restriction to recognize revenue. Since Microsoft restricts partners from selling Windows 8 until the end of October, they have not delivered the product contractually, hence they cannot recognize the revenue and uh, a few other people pointed out a cruel accounting ben was one of them the fact that to avoid having like a really bad month uh followed by a really good month or vice versa you want to even out the revenue based on when you're actually getting it so in, in the windows 8 case if they recognized all the revenue from windows 8 now they'd have this really great month and then the next month when all the windows 8 machines shipped they'd have a really crappy month because they wouldn't be making money off those Windows 8 machines that they already got the revenue for. So you do accrual counting, according to Ben, and you smooth it out and say, well, we're not going to recognize the revenue from Windows 8 yet, so this month looks normal, and then next month we'll recognize it when they actually ship. So that looks normal. It's always great to have financial like experts sending us information back. You guys are the best. Thank you for that. Really appreciate it. Not only Mukund and Ben, but everybody else who sent us stuff as well. It was very helpful. Well, that is it for this show. You can find us on the web. Uh, and our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com, let us know what kinds of stories uh, you would like to find on the show. In fact, uh, that's how I found the Amazon DRM story. Folks, let us know by submitting links or just voting on the links that have been submitted. It's, it's actually more important that most of you vote on the stuff and let us know, yeah, I like this story or I don't like this story. You can vote them up or down, technewstoday.reddit.com. A uh, big announcement that I want to make right now is that my wife uh, just put up on Twitter and Google Plus today that she has accepted a job at YouTube in Los Angeles. Now, a lot of people are already freaking out in the chat room like, that's it, uh, Tom's quitting. Not quitting, but I am moving with my wife to Los Angeles. So starting in January, we got a lot of time to get used to this. I will be doing the show over Skype uh, from Los Angeles. And Leo and I have actually discussed other possibilities for how to do the show remotely. Uh, we might may explore those in the future. But to start with, I'll just be on Skype. You guys will be here. A couple times a month, I'll be up here to shoot Sword and Laser anyway, so I'll be in the studio for those shows. If we let you sit here. If right. you if you <laughs> let me back. Uh, so if anyone's like, TNT's ending, Tom's no, leaving, nothing, please set them straight yeah, because no, nothing's really changing. Nothing is changing. And a few people are like, oh, but the Skype dynamic isn't the same. And we realize that, so we'll we'll try to figure out how to make it better, and that's why we're going to look at maybe if there's other options to reduce that lag. We need to figure out how to have remote hosts anyway, so mm -hmm. me being the guinea pig probably wouldn't have been my choice, but mm -hmm. too good of a gig for her to get Absolutely. To turned down. Congrats. Well, um, congratulations to yeah, her. Yeah, I'm super excited for her. I, I also have to do this to disclose that my wife works for Google now, so every Google story <laughs> I do, uh, yeah, I have to be the Kara Swisher of the team now. Well, maybe you can just have my a wife works for Google. Yeah, swear yeah exactly. Time disclosure. Uh, but there you go. So please try not to panic, and you folks out there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Don't no. Nothing's going to change until <laughs> January. Uh, thank you, Callie Lewis, for being on the show. Uh, let folks know all about Geek Beat and where they can find it. Yeah, uh, just head on over to geekbeat.tv or on youtube.com slash geekbeat.tv. Uh, we come out, you know, several times a, a week with all sorts of different stuff. And this week, our team is actually the official media streaming partner over at Photo Plus in New York. So we are going to be live streaming Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So awesome. all sorts of photo gear and interviews with photographers. So for, for newbies and for experts, it'll be awesome. 
Definitely check it out, geekbeat.tv. Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv, or give us a call. Leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. That's it for this episode. We will see you tomorrow with all new Apple goodness to talk about. Talk to you then. Maybe it'll be goodness. Maybe it'll be fabulous.